There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, a boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, chromium, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Welcome to this summary video for the nuclear chemistry and radioisotope chapter. In this summary video, I'm going to go briefly over each dot point, not much detail. But if you want to watch the actual videos in full detail to get that full picture, then I recommend you always watch the actual numbers that come below the dot point, because that's the number that is the actual video that covers this dot point. So I'll go for each quickly. Uh, first one is distinguish between stable and radioactive isotopes, and describe the conditions under which the nucleus is stable. And that's video number one. So we have to be able to distinguish between stable and radioactive isotopes. A stable radioisotope was one that was not too big, and it had an ideal proton to neutron ratio. A radioactive isotope was either too big, so it had an atomic number of greater than 83, or it had a non-ideal proton to neutron ratio, or both. Now these are the three examples of a radioisotope. Either it has atomic number, so this is the uh, atomic number, that, of equal to or less than 20. Its ideal ratio is one proton for every one neutron. If it has an atomic number of greater than 20, so 21 to 83, then it has an ideal ratio of one proton to every 1.5 neutrons. If it has an atomic number of greater than 83, it's always a radioisotope. It's always radioactive. So um, these are the, the actual ratios. You can see here, this is when it's stable. So this line I'm drawing now is when it's stable. And we said that from atomic number of 1 to 20, that ratio is about 1 to 1. So you can see this line here is meant to be the ideal ratio of 1 to 1. And it, f it stays on that line for about 1 to 20. Once we go above that, it goes off that line. That's the 1.5 to 1 ratio. And then once it's above 83, there's no more stable isotopes at all. Now when these are actually radioactive, they will decay. That word decay means that they eventually become stable again. And they become stable again by releasing radiation. And there's three different types of radiation. There is alpha radiation, which is a helium particle. There's beta radi radiation, which is when a neutron changes into a proton. And also releases an energy, a release electron actually, electron, so that's better. And gamma is just an energy ray. Nothing else is being released but energy. And this is, for example, if you have uranium, which is a radioactive um, element, if that becomes stable, it will do so through many steps. So here we can see uranium. At the end, we have lead, which is stable. So to get there, it'll actually go through lots of decays. These blue ones are your um, alpha, and these red ones are your beta. So they'll go through lots of different steps to eventually get to that stable state. That's an example of the decay itself. This might take thousands of millions of years. Um, then we have the second point, which is the second video, is identify instruments and processes that can be used to detect radiation. We said we have the Geiger counter or Geiger meter, which detects gamma radiation. We have the cloud chamber, which helps detect alpha radiation. And we have the film badge, which helps detect beta and gamma radiation. This is identifies. So all you need to know is you need to know these names of these different instruments. And if you want to know how they work, the video itself covers as well how they work. So number two covers that. Um, describe how transuranic elements are produced. First, we need to know what a transuranic element is. That's all elements that come after uranium in the periodic table. So here's uranium of 92. So anything above 92 is a transuranic element. There's three main ways that we can produce them. One of the most important ones is your particle accelerator. Now this is actually a picture of the particle accelerator. Basically a particle accelerator is a huge long tube. We have our ion, which is our source ion, and then we have our target ion, and this will actually be crashed into our target through the speed of light, so really almost the speed of light, so really quickly, and a magnetic field and an electrical field help produce that speed of light. So in this case we have our source, which is our nickel, and that crashes into our bismuth, which is a BI, our bismuth here, bismuth, that's our target, and we produce a much bigger um, much bigger elements, which is in this case rentinium. These numbers up here are their atomic numbers. We go from 29 plus 83 to 111. And then we also produce a neutron as well. Um, and here we have plutonium and helium. So when plutonium, oh sorry, actually the um, second part was neutron bombardment. In this case, we actually have a neutron, which we crash into, in this case, uranium. And this will absorb it and go from 92 atomic number eventually to 93 and to 94. 
So that's how we can actually produce from 92, which is a non-transuranic, because that's uranium, that's not transuranic. But from that, we can produce the other two, 93, 94. And this happens in nuclear reactor. And there's another way. We can have an alpha particle being bombarded into an element. In this case, we've got an alpha particle, which is a helium nuclei, being crashed into plutonium. So plutonium plus that helium particle goes into um, CM96. That's here. That's the curium. And that's another way we can produce a transuranic element. So remember these three ways, particle accelerators, neutron bombardment, and alpha particle bombardment. And you need to be able to describe how that happens as well, so how this works. Describe how commercial radioisotopes are produced. So transuranics were all the ones which were bigger than 92. Most of your commercial ones are smaller than 92. It's atomic number for smaller than 92. Um, and there's a couple of ways we can produce them. We can have neutron bombardment, so we have a in a neutron, we bombarded it into a element, and then the element picks it up, and eventually beta decays. In this case, we have molybdenum, which then beta decays into technetium 99. And say the atomic number 92 or less 92, this is not the atomic number, this is the mass number. But it has a atomic number of less 92. This is one way we can create transuranic, uh, one way we can create radioisotopes that are used for commercial uses. For example, technetium-99 for neutron bombardment. Second one was nuclear fission. That's where we crash a neutron. Again, same as with beforehand, we crash a neutron into an element, but this time we don't create a bigger one. We actually split it. This is splitting. So fusion is splitting. So we have one big one, and then we split it into many small ones. So here we create barium and krypton out of one big uranium, and we can use these in commercial uses both of these. So we've created them for splitting a bigger molecule. And we also have these ones, um, alpha particle bombardment and proton bombardment. We can use those two as well to actually produce radioisotopes that are used for commercial gains. So in this case we have to describe the way, so you have to be able to describe roughly how this works. Here we have identify one use of a named radioisotope in industry and medicine. Here I've got the named isotopes. I've actually given you a couple more than one uses. Cobalt-60 is used to take flaws in metal objects, also to sterilize surgical equipment and to prevent food spoilage. Technetium-99 is used to detect blood disorders and used to check the health of organs. These were the named radioisotopes and their uses. Now we have to describe the way in which these are used and explain their uses in terms of properties. We said that, for example, cobalt-60 was used to be able to identify flaws in metal objects. So here we have our cobalt-60. Cobalt-60 emits gamma radiation. You can imagine these white bits to be our flaws. Uh, if there were no flaws, like they're here, there are no flaws, then the actual thing could penetrate, wouldn't be able to pass. But if there are flaws, they can penetrate all the way through. And if they do, there's a film badge on the other side. Film badge picks up radiation. And if it does, it changes color. In this case, you could imagine it doesn't actually go from blue to red, but it goes from blue to red. So now we know that there are flaws in this object because gamma radiation could pass through. Um, if its properties it emits very strong gamma radiation, which makes it possible, which makes gamma radiation move through uh, objects if there are flaws in it. And it has similar properties to other metals, which means we can move it around like other metals. They're solid, but we need to make sure we don't get contact with that radiation because it's very powerful. And we have technetium-99, that was the other, this one was the industrial one, the other one was the medical one, you need to have one of each. Here we have, the way it gets used is it gets put in the body, and when it gets put in the body, it deposits. So here we can see the scan itself, there's some technetium-99 which have deposited, and you can see it in the bone scan. So that we, that's the way we can check different places, if they're, how big they are, or if they're all intact for this scan. Its properties that allow it to be used in this kind of environment are that it emits weak gamma radiation, which is good because if it's strong, it would kill us. It has a short half-life of about six hours, which is good because if it stays in our body for too long, it could still be damaging. It's only there for a couple hours. It's also removed quite easily, excreted quite easily. Again, good because we don't want to keep it in our body for too long because it still has radioactive properties. It also forms compounds, which again helps us to be able to actually see things because they'll stay there for a while before it's removed, and it emits visible photons. So these photons come when we have gamma radiation happening, and these photons can then be picked up from a scanner to show us the insides of our body. That was how the properties relate to its use. 
Um, next was process information from secondary sources to describe recent discoveries of elements. So these were all the transuranic elements that were discovered. So first of all, we start with the um, early 1940s through a nuclear reactor. We found um, neptonium and plutonium, so atomic number 93 and 94. And that was done in the early 1940s by Seaborg and his team. Then between 1944 and 1953, that same team, Seaborg and the same team, discovered quite a few of the other ones from 95 to 101. Most of them were discovered by his team. And they found those at hydrogen bomb testing site, testing sites. Then for the more recent ones, so from 1950s to 2000, 2000 so all the bigger ones, so from 102 plus to 111 roughly, these were all found by particle accelerators. This is when you crash one ion into another ion and then make a bigger ion. And then recently, this is quite recent, we found the even bigger ones, so the 112 to 118, so we've discovered quite a few of these ones. And this was a very powerful, or very powerful ion accelerators. And this is how we've gone from not having any discovered any of these which have a number of greater than 92 to have discovered most of or quite a few of them through this advance in technology. We've gotten particle accelerators which we didn't have beforehand, nuclear reactors which allowed us to find neptonium, plutonium, and um, it went in sequence. So we found the smaller ones first and the bigger ones later. And then use available evidence to analyze benefits and problems in identified industries and medicines. So in your case, you have to actually find radioisotopes, which you talk about specifically, and talk about the benefits and problems with those radioisotopes. But I'm going to go cover them quite generally, because most of them have general problems and benefits. And then you can just apply it to whichever one you've chosen to take. So for the benefits, they are used to take health problems. So in many cases, for example, technetium-99 was one good one, which allowed us to scan our body for problems. Is used to find the age of fossils. This was, for example, carbon-14, which allowed us to be able to tell how old something was. And then it was also used to detect leaks in pipes. Again, there are a couple of radioisotopes which allowed that to happen. It's really beneficial because then we can actually find problems in, in pipes, which we will otherwise not be able to see. These are some of the benefits. Some of the problems would be the exposure to radiation. This causes cancer, and cancer is obviously pretty bad. So I actually should have done a negative because that's a problem. Exposure to radiation is a problem. Also nuclear waste, this is when we have um, stuff which takes millions of years to, to its half-life has millions of years of, to decay, but we can't get rid of it, so we have to store it somewhere and often dump it into sea. And it can still come back to haunt us and kill us eventually, uh, or kill marine life. So nuclear waste is a problem as well. And obviously we always have the threat of a nuclear meltdown, so we produce quite a few of the things in nuclear reactors, and if there's a problem with them, that might cause problems for us. Um, so these were the benefits and the problems, but you need to know, for your, in your case, you need to know an actual named radioisotope and the benefits and problems associated with that named radioisotope in both industry and medicine. Hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.